Paul, in his second epistle to Timothy, chapter 1, verse 7, says to his son in the gospel, Timothy, Timothy, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. I know you've heard that verse, you know it by heart, you could recite it in your sleep. I want to give you a context to start your day with real encouragement. Timothy is a young man who is facing major challenges. He has a tendency to be a little bit anxious because there are those who question his authority, there are those that question his validity, and there are those that are trying to intimidate him. As a matter of fact, Paul, when he says God has not given us a spirit of fear, is saying to someone he knows well, this is his son in the gospel, and he's concerned, he wants him to succeed. He knows he's not gonna be around much longer because Paul, when he writes 2 Timothy, is as close as he can be to being executed and beheaded by Rome for his preaching of the gospel. He's about to be martyred, and he wants to leave a legacy behind for his son Timothy and the gospel to grow from. And he says, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. And what he's saying there is, God didn't call you to walk in intimidation when others challenge you and try to control and manipulate you. And Timothy, I want you to remember something. Not only have you not been given a spirit of intimidation, here's what God has given you. God has given you a spirit of power. He's empowered you and he's caused you to walk in love. And because he's empowered you to walk in love, your mind is going to discover how disciplined and how sound it really is. Don't let anyone second guess you, son. Don't let anyone second guess what you think, how you think, the way you're walking. Because I've trained you well. I've cautioned you as I can as a father in the gospel. And you have powerful roots from your grandmother on down through the generations. You know the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And you also know that adversity is what enlarges your faith. So don't let these players intimidate you. Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Walk in the love of Christ and realize you're thinking straight and you're talking straight. And as you do that, you're gonna make an impact because as you carry his presence from that perspective, your presence will impact everyone that you touch. Today, you need to remember, God hasn't given you a spirit of intimidation. Walk in the power of the Spirit, flow in the love of Christ, and trust the soundness of the way your mind is being trained as it's renewed in the Spirit. Bless you. I want to read you a passage of Scripture that we all know from Romans 15, verse 13. It's a prayer that Paul prays for the Roman believers, and the Holy Spirit applies it to you and I. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that the power of the Holy Spirit may abound in hope in you. One of the things that is so devastating is how easy it is to fall into a sense of hopelessness when we don't quite see the changes that we desperately long to see in seasons of what someone called a long obedience in the same direction. Sometimes enduring happens for endurance sake. And in those seasons of endurance, the enemy can lie to us and convince us that there will be no breakthrough, convince us there will be no thing that will change the thing that needs to be changed. Nothing could be further from the truth. The God you serve is the God of hope. And the God of hope is not only in your present, he's in your future. He knows the end from the beginning, and he wants to take what wants to happen that hasn't happened yet by hope and break into your present in such a way that regardless of what has happened in the past or what is happening in the present, when hope invades that hopeless situation, you couldn't have predicted how God would have turned it around based on, well, if this happened here and this is happening here, this must be what's going on. No, 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 no. Hope breaks in without the ability to predict how it's going to arrive or what it's going to look like because you can't base hope on the way things have been or the way things are. God is going to shatter hopelessness in your life. What you are going through is a season. It is not a life sentence. And may the God 
of hope, deliver you from the hopelessness that causes helplessness to follow after it because he's given you the power of hope to abound in the Holy Spirit so that nothing will be impossible so that you can do all things in Christ. It gets better, I promise. Hope is on the way to you from the future into your now and the Father of lights and glory and the Father of spirits by His Holy Spirit is going to cause you today to abound in hope. Father, so be it in the name of Jesus. The psalmist in Psalm 126 verse 5 says, Those who sow in tears shall reap with joy. Now I believe every day is a good day, but I've also lived long enough to know that every day when we wake up, there are still some things that are going on in our lives that haven't actually transformed in the way God promises. And oftentimes we are investing our faith in seasons of struggle and seasons of grief, awaiting God's timing for the breakthroughs and for the release and for the harvest of righteousness we've been anticipating. The psalmist wants us to know that when God turns our captivity, our mourning is turned into dancing, our crying is turned into laughter, and what we need to keep on doing is sowing seeds of faith, sowing seeds of hope, sowing seeds of confidence, even through our tears. Remembering this, that tears are as much a prayer as all the shouting we do. God sees your tears. He hears your cries. He knows your affliction and he is coming down in this season to bring about a harvest of righteousness. You're gonna have a great day today, even if everything doesn't fully get realized in the next 24 hours. You're on your way to a breakthrough. You're on your way to a release. You're on your way to a harvest. And even if you have to sow in tears, remember this that in a dry season, when there's no rain coming from heaven, and you're planting that seed of faith in the ground, your tears are the water that guarantees your harvest is on the way. We all know that powerful verse from Jeremiah 29 verse 11, where the prophet says, for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. That word welfare is the word shalom. We hear it all the time from our Jewish brothers and sisters, but I wonder if we can hear it so much that we take it for granted. When Jeremiah is writing these words, he's writing to a company of people that have been dislocated and misplaced from the land of promise, and they're in a land called confusion. And they've been dislocated, and they've been mislocated, and they're waiting to be relocated in the promise. They've been exiled, and they want to get home. And Jeremiah wants us to know that in spite of the disorientation that can take place at certain seasons in our life, when we feel like we're being dislocated and mislocated, disoriented and misoriented, that God is gonna reorient us and replace us in a place that is filled with shalom and hope. Now, what is that that is shalom? Very simply, it is the absence of all things harmful, the presence of all things beneficial, and put more simply, nothing missing, nothing broken. It is God's desire as you begin today to realize that He knows the plans He has for you, and those plans involve nothing missing and nothing broken. Allow your heart to soak on that reality 
Allow your mind to meditate on the fact that the Prince of Shalom, Christ himself, brings to you in his person the absence of all things harmful and the presence of all things beneficial. You love him, he loves you, his father is a good, good father, and the best is yet to come. Father, seal this word to the hearts of your sons and daughters and glorify Jesus through them by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.